This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at DarshanTalks.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. We have with us uh, esteemed ethicist, world-renowned uh, bio, bioethics expert, Peter Koch, and uh, no relationship to the brothers. He's just extremely rich is what I gather. <laughs> uh, but, but, Some uh, big shoes to fill already, Darshan. <laughs> uh, no, Peter and I, um, I met, and we've been talking about bioethics actually for um, several months at this point. And he was kind enough to agree to jump onto the podcast and talk to us. Um, we were discussing some different topics, and uh, he was telling me about his uh, like topics he explores. And the one thing that really popped, and there are two different topics we were considering. The one topic I'm really, really excited to explore is um, is this bit of information around um, what can I do clinical trials on patients after they've passed away? What rights do patients have after they've passed away? But before we get into that, Peter, do you want to, do you want to introduce yourself to us? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm, a, uh, philosoph- I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Villanova University. Um, and my, my uh, interests are really in clinical ethics, um, less on the research side, more on the uh, sort of decision-making, patient, physician, uh, family interactions. Um, and I, I did my postdoc a few years ago uh, in clinical ethics. So it's a pretty specific field in that sense. Uh, but yeah, generally uh, I work in bioethics, some philosophy of medicine, which are questions of um, like what counts as a disease, what counts as a disorder, et cetera. Um, yeah, so looking forward to being on, being on your show. Thank you. So, so let, let's start with the basics. If I am a patient and I, um, I agree to participate in a clinical trial and then I pass away, first of all, do, does my consent carry over? So let's, let's do, uh, also kind of delay the groundwork. Let's keep it all within yeah. an ethical framework. Cause you know, okay. laws reflect different things in different places. So um, one is we have whenever a good parallel is uh, organ procurement because organ procurement takes place after a special of vital organs, I should say, takes place okay. after death. So when we talk about um, whether or not we can take organs from someone or do things to someone um, mm-hmm. after death, we're talking about a whole different set of like what's at stake ethically from prior to death. Um, so before somebody dies, one of the things that we're concerned about is their well-being, how this impacts how well their life goes. So that's how you get like all these really fundamental ethical principles like do no harm. That's, that's a claim about how we should treat patients uh, and how we should like maximize their well-being or at least promote their well-being without um, causing undue harm to them, which is essentially dropping off of a drop off of well-being. So that's like a a really fundamental way of approaching how we treat people. And people can say like, yeah, you can risk harming me as long as I consent. Uh, And that's what we talk about. Like the typical consent framework is I realize you're going to do something to me and my body and I'm going to waive my typical right against someone doing that. And now they're permitted to do it. So the, the interesting thing about um, about after death is it raises a ton of philosophical questions about what does it mean to wrong someone after death? And even more problematically, what would it mean to harm someone after death? So um, there's a lot of good kind of classic examples about this. Uh, for example, if say, um, Darshan, you put together a really nice trust for your, for like future generations. Right. Right. And you're like these, you know, I want my, I want my grandkids to inherit um, X, Y, and Z or my kids. Yeah. And so then uh, you die and then your trust gets activated or executed, whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
we totally misuse and abuse your trust. We don't use it in the way it was, you know, and we slander your name, all these things. So the, the question is, have we, have we done something wrong to you? Right. Is, is there a subject of the wrong? Because you're like, and, and so, I mean, put, put aside for a minute um, debates about the afterlife, whether or not we continue to exist in some other thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, just in like the ordinary sense of me talking about Darshan at this time after his death, what, what could ground the wrong? So for me personally, the, what you're describing is there's actually a Netflix documentary on this called The Art of the Steel. Have you heard of this? No. Okay, so um, so the Barnes Institute, um, which is a famous uh, art place that I'm sure you're aware of. But oh yeah, right here in Philly. Podcast. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It used to be up up in like I think it's either Upper Marion or Lower Marion outside Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. And Doctor Doctor Barnes um, just happened to be friends with the world's best artists at the time, and he was a big sort of supporter of the arts. Mm -hmm. And when he died, he made a promise that, you know what, you can have all my art, I give it away, but with the only intent that it can only be, be put up where it is. You cannot move it out of this location. Yep. So it was billions of dollars worth of art. I, I remember um, this whole debate happening here. I mean, it was, uh, yeah. it was a big thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. I didn't realize they uh, made a documentary about it, but it makes perfect sense. It was a, kind of a right. semi-scandal, right? Right, right, exactly. So they made a whole documentary about it, short version. They moved it. That was the one thing he requ requested not to happen, which to me is very reminiscent of what you're describing right now, which is the, the trust had a very specific goal, the, um, the, the trust, and, and we as a society, X number of years later, decided to violate that. Did, did we at that point ethically not do the right thing? Yeah. Is, is that good? Exactly. So like, this is part of it. It's, one is, did we not do the right thing? And, and a lot of people will be like, you didn't do the right thing. But then the, the second question, which is where you get, you know, you get really to, the, you're getting closer to the heart of ethics, not you in particular, but like sure. when you ask these questions, you know, um, is, okay, what is sometimes what we call like the wrong making feature of this? Like, why is it wrong? So like we can instinctively say like, it's just wrong to misuse uh, a trust. Right. But then what is the wrong making feature and, and also can it be overridden uh so can a trust be overridden or can the original opinion be overridden because trust is easy to override oh yeah, yeah i mean the, the original the uh original opinion and also ought ought to be overridden in right, the sense of right. like is it ethically permissible to override right. what would be the grounding for overriding it yep. um so it would take mr barnes for example did we do something like it, it would be weird to say we harm Mr. Barnes. In other words, make his life go worse because right. there doesn't seem to be a subject there anymore. Right. So what is so we violated some some like interests that Mr. Barnes had when he was alive. And now these interests continue, even though Mr. Barnes doesn't continue. So where exactly is the wrongness in that? It's it's a it's a kind of big theoretical question, right? Yeah. Um, but so we're like, okay, we've we've violated Mr. Barnes's interest somehow, even though he's he's not really there. Um, but it seems to be like there's some overriding good, the reasons for which we right. uh, violated his interest. Um, so bringing it back to sort of the question of clinical trials and your death. Prior to death, we are concerned about these, the adverse effects of trying certain things on you, right? Mm -hmm. And at least in part. And so we gain consent. After death, it's hard to see what sort of harms could befall a corpse, essentially. Well, I, I could argue, uh, answer that, which okay. is what if you're talking about some kind of reanimation? Do you oh, have so. <laughs> Good. So if we're talking about reanimation, that op opens up a whole uh, whole nother can of worms, um, which is one. I don't do know. We think study, that. Yeah. What's that? I don't know if that was the study, by the way. I just sort of made that up. But I. Assume oh, no, I mean that we can totally okay. take that direction. That's super, <laughs> super fascinating. <laughs> um, typically, when you think of so it, 
exactly like the, the structure that i'm thinking of is like the typical structure of death is irreversible and that's like if you look at the the pretty much all the literature on death up and uh, you have this pocket of course of like transhumanism all this stuff mm -hmm. um which is we can get into uh whatever but um when you look at all of the medical practices that surround death mm -hmm. they operate with one of the conditions of death being irreversible which is why you have determinations of death the way they are which is again why you have um organ procurement being permissible uh when it is which is you know it's, it's required by the dead donor rule that you don't take these vital unpaired organs um you have all these practices of things you cannot do to living people but that you can do to dead people because the assumption is death is irreversible so there's going to be no reanimation right but if reanimation occurs then you actually have this whole um that whole window of being dead you could now account for harms during that right but there's so there's this um let me, <laughs> there's a a debate in uh a philosophical debate about whether or not death is uh whether or not death is irreversible and what it would mean for it to be irreversible so there's um a question of whether it's logically necessary for death to be irreversible in the sense that when something's logically necessary you could not conceive of it um being otherwise as opposed okay. to something being like uh practically necessary and i'll give you an example of the difference between the two like um it might be a practically necessary fact that uh human beings will never grow to uh, will won't grow to be 20 feet tall like it's just this structure like it's in other words it's very 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 likely it's not going to happen but right. it's not like conceptually impossible to imagine a cool. 20 foot tall human however right. it is logically necessary that a square has four sides like right. you can sit there all day long and think about a three-sided square but you're really thinking about a triangle like you're not yeah. thinking about a three-sided square right right so the question is is death is it logically uh is it a component of death that it's irreversible like four-sided it is to a square or is it just something that's so far has been like a rule of thumb about death mm -hmm. that it's <laughs> you know what i mean that it's that it's I like a 20-foot human that's like a rule of thumb <laughs> that it's irreversible <laughs> so yeah i mean if you if if you want to leave open the the possibility of reanimation then um cremation could be a serious serious harm oh wow i hadn't even thought of that because we're yeah we're really uh robbing someone of of a nice reanimation possibility but um yeah okay generally you can but you can see how like the typical structure of of when we're worried about what's the wrong thing to do to somebody changes from it changes at the point of death because we have very different considerations generally speaking so Actually, yeah yeah I'm, I'm here I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the implications of this because you're right um, if we start thinking about things as, like you said, rule of thumb versus um, just inherent, mm -hmm. uh, like, does, and and now I'm, I'm because of you and because of this thought process, I'm going: is that at that point a second life, as opposed to reanimation of the first life? And does that have its own implications? Oh like, man! <laughs> <laughs> so this, yeah, this is a great question too. I mean, it's. Um, this this is a question this is a category of questions we call uh personal identity and persistence conditions it's like what things could happen to you that you could uh that you could endure and like still it could still be you after the event happens um can, can i give you an example that i think is perfect for this actually yeah 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 which was i uh, i heard about this guy who was on death row uh -huh. he died and then came back uh -huh. And then said, and you can't put me back to death. 
because I already met the condition. <laughs> that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, so, I think the court, court said, no, that's not how this works. But yeah, they're like, sorry, man. <laughs> angle. Because I met your condition for my first life. This is my second life. You can't go, you can't give the second person a new, a new death. Yeah, exactly. And, and, um, you have, uh, so there's been some interesting cases of, I don't know if you recall Jahai McMath a few years ago. She was, I uh, like, uh, I want to say preteen, maybe she was 11, went in for a tonsillectomy and, um, ended up being diagnosed brain dead. Oh, wow. And then, so which is legal and clinical death. And then she was transferred to a state that had different, essentially, uh, had an opening where they didn't legally have to equate brain death with death. So she legally resurrected when she moved from California to New Jersey. <laughs> she, you like had like, yeah, a death and then a reversal of the, the death certificate just by crossing state lines. Um, but, but kind of going back to what we we're saying really early on is like just distinguishing between there's all these legal structures, et cetera, but we want to talk about like, the the biological phenomenon of death and what that would mean um to you like to your what we can say persistence conditions about can you as a as darshan as a person um survive the the disintegration of your organism essentially even if it's temporary and um I'll give you another example of how, how these puzzles come into play. So yeah. like uh, some people argue that persons are essentially psychological beings, like psychological con continuity, mm -hmm. where you, Darshan, are, are um, identical or you persist across the period where you have your thoughts and ideas and psychology all are uh, continuous, essentially. There's, there's enough connection between them um which has the kind of odd implication so people think this is like uh, when you start doing like tests on this people think that this is pretty um uh intuitive in some senses but um imagine that you develop severe alzheimer's and right. you dramatically change you lose any sort of connection to your past self Right. arguably a new person has popped into existence if you have a psychological view of continuity if you have a purely materialistic view like strictly materialistic view mm -hmm. um then you actually don't retain the same material throughout your life you right. swap out cells you know so then people are like well not s the simple materialism but the sort of living animal and uh, you're probably going to regret having a philosopher on your show but um, <laughs> I'm loving it already. <laughs> so, so the animal view is is strange because uh, the the tests that people use are, um, or the the kind of arguments that people use are. Imagine that you, Darshan. Uh, you, I think you like this because you like kind of transhumanism stuff, right? Yeah. Um, imagine you have a serious like you get in a terrible car accident and your cerebrum remains intact, your upper brain. Yep. And, uh, but the rest of your body is like completely battered. Um, you'd be immobile, completely dependent on other people. It's a tons of pain. So yeah. we're like, let's take Darshan's brain and put it into a, another body that right. we can make it just like Darshan's. Right. Uh, and the, so the question is, where do, where do you go? Do you so, follow your brain or do you, mm -hmm. do you get a new, new thing? Kind of going back, this kind of, yeah, go it ahead. It reminds me of the original Greek philosophy argument of the ship of Thebes. Uh, have, you, yeah. have you heard? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, just for those who haven't heard, it's basically a ship goes away and every so often they'd replace sort of the wood boards on there and they'd replace sort of the mast and replace the sails. So when the ship comes back, was it the same ship that came back or is it a different ship? Because they replaced all those things. It's the same exact argument, but for a human. Yeah, and, and it is. And it's part of it is what are your essential features? Like a ship, um, 
has a whole bunch of parts that sort of contribute to the ship as a whole. And there's like interesting variations in the ship of thieves where um, you have the ship, uh, you replay, you pull off one plank, put it in a warehouse and you replace it. Then you pull off another, put it in a warehouse, replace it. And you think you still have the same ship, but yeah. then you get to the end and then you go to all those old planks and, and then ship. you rebuild it <laughs> you're like okay which one is the ship of thieves <laughs> um but for humans it's true that we we swap out parts like a ship of thieves all the time but what is the essential part that if you lost it you would no longer remain there so your options are kind of you go with your your brain in which case it seems like you're a set, your essential feature that which you can't do without is and it's your upper brain in the case of the example we gave right mm -hmm. so it's your psychology you follow your psychology which is why people abide by the um or hold that view that you're essentially a psychological being uh or you remain in that battered body mm -hmm. and a new entity comes into being where um your brain went or perhaps that body where your brain went it just remains th that body but with a new psychology so these are like these are metaphysical questions about what constitutes a person and where persons go i'm, I'm gonna add you add another option in there which is, <laughs> you mentioned transhumanism that's one of my shticks if you will yeah. uh, but what happens if i take um take my knowledge and I, if I'm dying, I take my knowledge, put it into a computer. And and now the AI is interpreting what Darshan wanted. And can yeah. the AI then for me if the AI is me or was based on me? And, and this is super problematic because, um, I mean, it's problematic for the uh, psychological continuity view because um, one, one is so it would be if you could only do it to like a single uh if you could only upload your psychology to a single whatever entity then right. it'd be less problematic because you'd be like darshan goes where it is but we can replicate that we can have right. a thousand darshans right? right so then it's like okay they all seem equal candidates for the continuity of darshan so what do we have a thousand darshans but we also don't want to say that uh can does it matter yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> argument if they all have the same opinion? Well, it does matter in the sense of how we, uh, like moral culpability, for example. Um, okay. Like some of the really fundamental things that we're concerned about people is, um, is like what sort of things are responsible throughout their life, what sort of uh, interests they have continuing throughout their life that can be frustrated or um or fulfilled to make their life better or worse what sort of uh interests are authentic to them versus what sort of interests are you know like inauthentic or whatever so right. it's a lot of it's a lot of questions of one there's a lot of interesting questions about moral responsibility and also uh questions about well-being across time um and questions about uh like fundamentally when we have persons there seems to be some a strong intuitive pull that persons uh are when uh you've multiple persons they're all distinct from one another and they all exist within like a temporal spatial or yeah temporal spatial points so when you have this replication problem and you have equal candidates, then it seems to undermine our metaphysics of how we treat persons in the first place. And then the implications of that are all over the place. And the, the whole, like, like you're bringing up Darsha, the whole question of existing in the, into the future, you know, being, uh, um, I should say existing into the future as other, inhabiting other sort of entities it's pressing what it's not just about like can i exist as an uploaded brain because whatever the implications are about existing as an uploading brain they they affect 
how we are now. So even if we haven't done the brain uploads or whatever, we right. still now have different moral frameworks for the normal you and me in embodied in flesh. You see what I'm saying? So like- no, repeat, repeat this example for me. I, I'm sorry, I feel like I didn't follow this one. Okay, so um, say that we, let me let me go back to the beginning. We have these metaph metaph metaphysical questions of what it means for a person to continue, right? Sure. Yep. And we have these options like uh, you're essentially a embodied organic human, you know, with the yep. right kind of history, or you're a embodied mind, or you're a disembodied mind in data. Right. So here are a few options, and then. Uh, w one of your questions, which is a great one, is, well, what would it really matter, right? right? If it turns out that I'm a disembodied mind and there could be a thousand of me because I can replicate that disembodied mind. Right. Well, what it matters is that if it turns out that you can exist, so to speak, in a thousand different, uh, like, at a single time, you, you're, what makes you you, which is your mind, can exist at a thousand different uh, distinct like entities. Right. Then we have to really revisit how we understand ourselves now. Okay. Like in the sense of, in the sense of um, how we understand human beings, our basic assumptions about what human beings are currently as like these embodied things that have forever been distinct because of spatial parameters so and the the oh go ahead, go ahead. no to, to me that I, I don't fully understand the implications because i'm now sort of mixing f uh, physics with uh bioethics which which obviously wasn't complicated enough right so uh, yeah. the <laughs> the the one thing i keep hearing about is the parallel worlds theory that all all decisions at all times could have been made a different way. And there are multiple universes where those alternative decisions were made. Therefore, by definition, I exist in, in an infinity, basically. There are the multiple versions of me across different timelines. Yeah. Is that the same thing or so is that different? It's another way of approaching the same thing, but even if you have, um, so part of this is, and like you said, it, at any given point and any given decision, any given, it's actually any given change. It's not even necessarily decisions, right? It's like uh, you have what, I guess the best way to imagine is the way you said it, which is you have like literally another world in which you exist, but having gone, having done otherwise. And right. this goes for every possibility. Um, one, you have, this, this creates a structure of the world that, makes us rethink morality, right? Because um, if every other option exists and functions, then it's not that classical framework of free will, which is we chose not to do the thing. Because, so imagine the, imagine the, um, imagine the you that's in, not in front of me right now, but talking to me right now. Um, that you, is it, are you this you in virtue of decisions you made or in virtue of decisions that uh, parallel Darshan's made that sort of you were the result of not being what that other dash the, the decision well, how, the other Darshan made. How would you know who made that decision though? You, I, I think that's, I think this, this structure gets rid of decisions. Right. You know what I mean? And that's why it's like fundamentally changes how we think of morality. Because morale, like culpability and praiseworthiness are grounded in the assumptions that we make decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you get rid of decisions. And you're just, you know, like, what do you, okay. we just totally, re this is why, like, whatever your view is of the person and of the universe and of worlds, we, we still have to reconcile that with the fundamental frameworks of morality. So, I mean, even going back to clinical trials, yeah. uh, Thank you for pulling it back, by the way. I was <laughs> really um, yeah, I think I'll, you're, 
I think there's gonna be a handful of listeners like what just what direction <laughs> did we just go um but uh so going back to clinical trials if it turns out that um you know the in whatever all the possibilities are actually realized in other worlds then there is a world where we continue to try these clinical trials on a corpse and then another world where we didn't and then we just have you know we just have like all the other all the all the outcomes are as real as the other outcome so where is the where is the decision in all this yeah that's why it's like it really makes the the fundamental fundamental frameworks for these really these questions that we find to be very very important um it makes you revisit them so the only way to stop this is to tell the phys- uh, tell people who are physic uh, f- tell physicists not to do any more exploration because we just simply cannot handle the more opportunities and more questions that pop out of this That's the only <laughs> no. <laughs> no i think so let's let's say like let's say we just have a pretty straightforward framework of people and um like the the kind of the framework that medicine operates under right now which is when people right. die they're not going to be reanimated uh when people die we're not gonna um unless it's like very explicit we're not gonna treat the or we're not gonna factor in treatment of the corpse with afterlife consideration so like um it you know overtly like when someone has for example jehovah's witness or something or um judaism or catholicism there's certain things you can't do to a corpse uh but say we have the basic framework of when someone dies they whatever we do to that corpse is not necessarily what we do to that person and that can, is can stop you for a second yeah so I, i'm hindu by by, by religion mm-hmm. and in Hinduism, the idea is that you're reincarnated and that you have karmic flow, if you will, for lack of a better term. Here's yep. my question. If you don't let me be, if you don't let my um, my body go, like, get cremated or whatever, because we've come up with a new philosophical um, paradigm, does that prevent me from going down and having karmic flow? And so my this, rights in my life? Yeah, and this is, this is why I was like, you know, I think it's... Uh, we have we have all sorts of um, options for people at, for people's wishes about their corpse after death, and we leave that open. But like the baseline is like unless you um, say what you what you wish to do with your corpse, right. like some some people are opposed to cremation, some people are you know like in, in principle, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we have this medicine operates with like a neutrality about this which is uh the fun of the baseline being um when someone dies the treatment of the corpse is not the treatment of the person themselves oh it's it's a you so you respect the corpse in virtue of the person that was once there but it's not necessarily it's it's not the uh, the treatment of the person. So, so then it, it, what, what I hear you saying then is I don't have a right in saying no to potential treatments or clinical trials on me after my own death. Well, let me. So what I'm saying, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really made that jump yet. It's just that if you didn't have the right or did have the right, it wouldn't be based on like, um, it wouldn't be based on the same sort of wouldn't be exactly identical to the kinds of rights you'd claim when you're living in your body, or when you are a living body. I'll give you a quick example. Um, say you have a. <laughs> Um, Gates, hey, come here. Uh, say you have a, there's a pandemic or something like this. We, and you, we think that you have gotten this infection and then you've, uh, you pass away from it. Right. We couldn't perform in, we couldn't 
cut you open against your will and check to see if you have this infection. If say there's the only way you could do it is to you know cut somebody open or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe you could, but it would be overriding a different set of things than if you die mm -hmm. and we we uh, perform an autopsy against your will. Like say you and this right. happens, right? Like we're like right. we're we're going to do this. So it seems like different things are at stake after death and before death. And the argument people make is like, okay, so maybe it's not you that we're, we're dealing with, with when we deal with a corpse, but mm -hmm. we're dealing with property or like in a state, so to speak. Right, right. Something that survives you. That's, that's kind of why I brought up the trust earlier with the Barnes things, because it's like the corpse seems to have um, a the set of rights that are more like property right um and ethically i'm not even and actually legally i think there's a lot of parallel with that right you would know better than i would but i, I honestly have not looked at the legal rights of corpses so I yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting i mean I, it's interesting the like you can't when you, so when you for example there's there are both ethical and legal um prohibitions against treating corpses certain ways what is the grounding? It's not that you're making someone's life worse or making someone's well-being drop. It's that we ought to respect corpses um, for what they once, for what they once, rep for, for what they once were, but um, better said, like for what they represent. And so it's again, it's like a different, um, a different set of underlying ethical principles. It's like. Kind of like you treat a flag in a certain way, not oh, because it is the country, but because it represents the country. Oh. So is my body just a flag for my mind. It, yeah, like people make that argument, That's and then nice. is, yeah. Oh, uh, good. This, I have to cut a short because. I feel like we're going to start li having listeners just go, this could just literally go on for days. <laughs> it really could. Okay, yeah, definitely <laughs> definitely stop us. <laughs> uh, what I'd love to do is have you on again uh, in a little bit and continue one or more of these conversations. Would you be okay? Yeah, to totally. I'd be, def I'd be down for sure. I'll try to keep uh, keep us a little more trained on the initial question next time, but I'm some good stuff came out of this. <laughs> this was the best conversation I've had in a long, long time. Awesome. So Likewise, it was a lot of fun, man. <laughs> uh, pleasure having you on. And again, you work at Rutgers, so if people want to go take the class, sign up for uh, Peter Koch's class, unless he doesn't want to take any more students. V Villanova, not... Villanova, but uh, there's some really good philosophers at Rutgers, actually. So. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah. So uh, this is going to be awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to having you on. By the way, did I say Rutgers? Or, I uh, thought you did. It's all right. Don't worry about uh, it. Villanova, right? Yep, yep, Villanova. You're yeah, good. I looked at you when she went Villanova. I was like, wait, what did I say? <laughs> uh, uh, Villanova. Uh, but this was awesome, and we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, definitely. Take care. Thank you. Take care. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks